insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You are about to listen to the Cybercognition Podcast, a show about artificial intelligence and how it is transforming the world around us with your biological, sentient, and mostly rational human host, Hutch. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Welcome to another episode of Cybercognition. We are, uh, myself and Lynn are coming to you today, both in hoodies, because I, it doesn't seem to matter where you're at right now in the United States, it is cold outside. Um, so hopefully everybody's staying warm. Uh, and uh, so this is our first podcast of the new year, so uh, really excited to be here. 2024. Uh, yep. Uh, Lynn, any, any words to kick us off? I am excited to be here, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, let's get into it. Awesome. Okay, so uh, yeah, we're we're gonna today we're gonna talk about a little bit of what's been going on. It's it's been an interesting few weeks in the beginning of 2024. Uh, we've had the the CES, the Consumer Electronics. Uh, actually, I don't know what the S stands for. Summit, I think. Uh, but I thought it was show. Maybe it is show. Um, but in any case, where the, the cool consumer electronics are coming out and, and like anything technology right now, we're seeing a lot of AI there um, and some other interesting stuff in the news. So we'll, we'll talk through that. And then we are going to do a deep dive segment on hallucinations. And this is not the type of hallucinations that's brought to you by mushrooms and LSD, but instead talking about hallucinations within the context of artificial intelligence. Uh, which I think is brought to you by LLMs. There you go by by the other L acronym. I like it. Um, so uh, jumping right into the news. So one of the big products that really took off at CES, and actually they've they've sold out two different rounds of ten thousand products. Yep, the the rabbit. Uh, have you seen this, Lynn? I have, and honestly, I don't like it. I don't either. So, but but I think it it does. So. I Real think we need to tell people what it is. I mean, you and yeah. I are familiar, but you, you keyed this up, man. So go, take it. So it's, it's a small pocket device. It seems like based on, so I did watch the keynote from the, the guy that founded the company. And it seems like the intention is to replace the operating system with a large language model or what they call a large action model. And really all that is, is just a, another acronym to describe a language model that is operating as an agent. So it is able to take actions. And uh, so the idea of the whole interface is a conversation. You tell it what it, you want it to do. It has access to various different backend APIs uh, plugged into with your keys to your accounts and is able to take action on the things that you ask it to do. Uh, and that that's the whole interface. There is no traditional apps mm -hmm. uh, poke around and the doing fact that you these things are going after the mobile market and the they're i i watched the keynote as well and the one thing that i found really interesting was the fact the way that they're talking about breaking away from an app kind of model to me this thing is just an accident waiting to happen yeah Anytime, absolutely i mean we've talked a lot about the concepts of just user input you know, as long as we're standing in 2004, January 16th, right now, when we're looking at the mobile market, everything is the app base, you know, and it's, it's doesn't matter if you're Android, iPhone, and that segmented application space, I think is very important. The thing that scares me the most about the rabbit is honestly the UI and the fact that it's all language based. We're we're going right back to what we've talked about in the past on this exact show in terms of words have different meaning based on context. Absolutely, yeah. There's there's it's another layer of abstraction that gets us further away from the computer and what it's doing, 
And I think there's a lot of room to where the language that we are using to interface with the system now is much more open to interpretation than traditional APIs in the way that we interact with mobile apps. And so I agree. I, I, I think that uh, it is concerning seeing that, but, but I do think that the fact that it sold out the way that it did does show that there is a significant consumer market and a consumer interest for this type of device, which to me, it, like you said, I, I think we're, we're opening up Pandora's box. I think the likelihood that we start having problems with something like this because of that ambiguity around, around language is significant. But at the same time, just looking at the fact that we see this device, this is something, this is the first time we've seen somebody try to almost mobilize a, a, an AI LLM interface. You know, yep. we've we've heard about, you know, integrating AI into things like Bing, Chrome, but now we're seeing a step beyond integration and actually making it the native platform. You know, and I think this is definitely an, an area of the market that we need to watch. Agreed. So, yeah, for anybody that's listening, again, the, the device is called the Rabbit. Uh, you can find it at rabbittech.com. Um, admittedly, I, I may get one just to play around with it. I don't... I. But again, I, I don't, I, I have honest. a lot of concerns. We're both going to get one to play with it. Yeah, I mean, you, I, I, you, you, you're the master of the language of deception, man. Anything with AI, I expect you to at least have and see if you can break. Yep, for sure. And and I, I do think there's potential risk here. So it may be one to, to hack around with if, if you're interested in seeing what you can, I, there's there's no question that people are already working on trying to jailbreak this thing, get it to do things that it's not supposed to, so. So, I mean, does this mean that we're gonna have a, a, a rabbit version of Dan soon? Stay tuned, mm -hmm. we'll find rabbit out. Rabbit Dan, there you go. Rabbit Dan. <laughs> All right, the, so, the next, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, uh, the next thing on the on the list of our stuff, as far as I know, is the research paper that was actually released on the, the multimodal self-driving framework. Yeah, so what, what's interesting about this and, and why this stood out to me is we've got, uh, right now, most of our self-driving technology, at least the, well, okay, so Tesla is kind of its own thing. Tesla runs on just the traditional computer vision, regular light sensors. But if you look at any of the big self-driving services that are exclusively for that purpose, stuff like Waymo, stuff like Cruise, they are running on multiple different modalities already. So they do have LIDAR, radar, uh, also that uh, RGB, traditional yep. computer vision. But one thing that you haven't seen in any of these frameworks is thermal vision or visioning. Mm -hmm. And or, it, it's interesting because we recently had the problem with Cruise. And I, I do want to, at some point in the near future, do a dedicated episode to self-driving because I think there's some fascinating stories in the development of each of these different groups. But the this recent issue with Cruise was, of course, a person was uh, essentially dragged under one of these vehicles. And the there is an argument that self-driving is has less incidents or less issues than regular driving but some of the issues that do happen would never happen if it was a human driver and i, I think this is one of those cases and i think that's why it's uh, unsettling for a lot of people but thermal introduces a, an interesting new perspective because of course uh, biological entities have their own unique heat sig or, or signatures and I think even in places where light is obstructed or traditional computer vision may be problematic, it could add an additional modality that makes these uh, less likely to have problems such as what we saw happen with Cruise. Well, I mean, if you take a look at it just from a governmental perspective, they've been using thermal imaging for decades, you know, but you know, for anybody that's interested in reading this article, I, I would highly recommend it. You can actually find this at uh, arxiv.org. Uh, but yeah, and, and we'll, we'll we'll throw it in the show. We'll, we'll post all this the links in, in the chat. But the thing that I found really interesting about this is just how they're actually doing what we've been talking about in the industry for years. They're actually layering the the, the, the different techniques. You know, you brought up Tesla and the fact that they're just using standard computer vision. 
that's to me the same way as saying a single point of access. You know, you're, you're putting all of your eggs in one basket. But let me ask you a diversion question here for just a second, Hutch. I know the answer to my answer to this question. Would you ever trust a self-driving car? So uh, interestingly enough, I actually was recently in San Francisco and I did take a ride with Waymo through uh, Golden Gate Park. And really? honestly, I was I was really impressed. So I had already kind of looked at both of the two options between Waymo and Cruise. And even before Cruise has it, or had its issues, my immediate thought was you've got Waymo, which is a subsidiary of Google, who has some of the biggest chops in the industry as far as machine learning. And then you've got Cruise, which is a subsidiary of GMC. And then I looked at some of the white papers and research and it, it was a, immediate apparent to me that it was kind of the difference between night and day. I, I had zero interest in trying cruise. I did want to try uh, Waymo. Admittedly, I just did a, a small joy ride through the park because I do have uh, some concerns there. But I, I admittedly was impressed with the ride. I mean, there was, I mean, this is Golden Gate Park. There are uh, every single hipster playing frisbee golf is jumping in front of the vehicle at random times. You've got dogs darting out out Are of you actually nowhere. You actually it had a couple situations, situations really. Oh yeah, very it unusual situations. Drive and it was able to interface with those correctly. Yeah, it did very well. It, I was really impressed with how it handled. So uh, I, I, I do think that five, ten years down the road, uh, industries like Uber and other people who do driving for a profession, I, I think there's a significant possibility that we do see more of that market share increasingly move over to autonomous vehicles. That is, unfortunately, by my standards, uh, I agree that's the way it's going. Personally, I'm too much of a cynic and I'm way too jaded to ever trust a computer with that much t ability to con to end my life. <laughs> yep. Uh, no, I, I definitely get that. And I, I had reservations getting on it myself. You're, but, you're um, a brave man, Hutch. You're a brave man. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, definitely stories we'll have to dive into a little bit more whenever we do that that dedicated segment. Um, Lynn, any more comments on this one before we jump well, over to the last one? No, I think what, you know the only thing I'll say is I, I agree with you. This is going to be a long conversation, and we need to dedicate at least an hour to this one. Yeah, for sure. All right, final one was uh, th this one was I, I can't say too surprising, but. Uh, unfortunately the case uh open ai did so uh it, it seems like a lot of tech journalists right now have now taken to where they they have robots that are basically looking at various different tech leader websites on their statement of values and and as soon as something changes and there's no official press release about it it almost always gets reported uh we saw this uh, uh we've actually seen this a couple times with open ai but in any case, uh, OpenAI did kind of silently change their uh, terms of use for their different services, uh, specifically their chat GPT capabilities, to where they removed the words uh, that prohibited the use of chat GPT for purposes related to military and warfare. Yep. And I... I think the writing on the wall is pretty apparent that if there's not already conversations going on with, uh, and I'm sure there probably are with military contractors. Um, I, I think they probably are working with the, the feds to figure out military use cases and ways that this can be applied. Um, well, what scares me is actually the, the wording of the revision. Basically, you know, they went from saying you can do nothing around military and warfare and changed it to a, one of the most general terms I've ever heard and just basically said, do no harm. You know, well, harm is a very broad term and has many interpretations. You know, so unlike the, you know, when we've talked in the past about, you know, chat GPT and LLMs having all the information and it's just our roadblocks that we put on there. This to me is the first step of er eroding those, those roadblocks. You know, what's interesting is, and I didn't do this intentionally when I dropped the news into the list of orders that we did, but in each of our three news articles here that we've discussed, each one kind of shows uh, an evolving of empowering 
systems even further with the, the kind of higher risk capabilities. We looked at kind of first your your very simple consumer model that'll call your Uber for you with the, the yeah. rabbit agent. Then we talked about putting people in vehicles that are driven via machine learning. And now we're talking about potentially empowering systems with the ability to take a human life without a human in the loop on that. Exactly. So, I mean, just from the news, we said this on our productions panel that AI is going to basically be the topic of conversation for 2024 in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And the news in the, that we've given out today just basically validates that point. Yep. That escalated quickly. Very. So buckle up. We're in for an interesting year. Yep, for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I don't want to speculate too much on on kind of what's going on with open AI. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff that isn't being spoken well, about. I mean, as but. just a side note to, to the third news bullet, and we didn't even get into it today. You know, what about the open AI GPT market that's about to come hit? I mean, there's the all kinds GPDs. of stuff that's about to happen. And, you know, I, I've been using this phrase most of my life, and I find that especially when, when discussing the topics around this podcast, it, it is very, very true. We don't know what we don't know yet. No. Unknown unknowns, right? The unknown unknowns. And, and, you know, to that point, it, it matters not that we, we don't know what it is now. We're still going to be expected to react immediately, immediately once we do know. Well, future is fun. Yep. So that, right. I think that, that takes care of the news updates. Let's talk hallucinations. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything to take, so I guess we'll have to, you know, leave it to the LLMs to hallucinate for us. So <laughs> real quick, let's start out with some definitions. Uh, what would you define an, a, an LLM hallucination as? I think... Keeping or keeping it in the most simple terms possible, uh, hallucination within the context of artificial intelligence is when the system fabricates information that isn't true. And now, one point that I would like to add to that: it may not be true, but in my personal experiences with Chat GPT, it may not be true. But it, if you didn't know it wasn't true, it still looks factually correct and that i believe is the bigger problem yeah that they're very convincing and they will double down and and fabricate additional fake information to further support, support the fake information yep absolutely so yeah. this you know and i be, i gotta believe anybody who's really delved into playing with chat gpt or any of the other llms out there they've experienced some form of this misinformation being returned and though it may seem very small and insignificant if you're trying to get it to tell you how to explain quantum physics to a six-year-old, you know, tell me how to explain quantum physics to a six-year-old in storybook format. You know, it may get that. But at the same time, these have real-world consequences. What's interesting is I think you're right that almost anybody that's played with these models has probably experienced hallucinations. I have my doubts as to whether most people have noticed it because I think uh, people mm -hmm. who are tech savvy likely are and understand the limitations of these systems likely are going to fact check the information coming out of them. But people that aren't, they may interact with these systems and just take it on face value. So they may experience the hallucinations, but never have awareness that they did. Oh, yeah. And that I think that leads us into some really Case, you know, on point, you know, excuse me, let me try that again. I know we're live. So uh, to that point, I think we have some great real world examples of, of exactly what we're talking about here. You know, and as, as dumb as it sounds, the, the first one that, you know, is on the list to discuss is actually around legalities. You know, yep. You, you, in my opinion, you said the key phrase is they don't know, but there's a couple of lawyers that found out r the real hard way. 
yeah, there was a, a lawyer that uh, was reported on by my multiple different uh, journals, but uh, Ars Technica is the one that we pulled up. But mm-hmm. he basically was doing research for a, a case and was looking for because, of course, anytime you're doing law, you're there's the question of the laws that exist, but there's also the question of legal precedent and previous mm-hmm. cases that have ruled on those laws, that have interpreted those laws. And, and I think that latter part is probably even more significant. And it's a large part of what lawyers do is research that legal precedent. And so do what this lawyer point. was... I, I got a new definition for you here, Hutch. Do you know what the street definition for a lawyer is? I do not. Attack librarian. <laughs> I like it, but it is, it's, there's so much research, so much exactly. digging through books. Yep. Um, so, so essentially he just asked it kind of what existing cases are there and it created fake cases that had never actually taken place to support the position that he was trying to take. And, uh, the, the judge did some research or had his clerk Actually, do some research. It was opposing counsel that did the research. Was it? Yeah. So, somebody, somebody figured out that they're, they're, they started trying to find these and they could not find any record of these cases. And uh, it ultimately came to life. One of the parts about that that really was the crux of, of why the judges were so angry about this is that they had actually, I believe it was the 11th Circuit Court was actually the court that was cited for these fake uh, you know, precedent cases, and it actually named real judges. So it was real judges on a real appellate court. And this was not only damaging to the the case that these lawyers were actually trying to, to win, but it also brought up into scrutiny the fact that these judges are now involved because they're being state. Uh, there's claims that they have set precedent that was never actually set. Yep. And there's actually several lawsuits right now against OpenAI for libel because of that exact reason where it will Mm -hmm. bring in real people into the context of kind of hallucinated circumstances and basically say they were involved in things or engaged in activities that they had no involvement with whatsoever. So uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely an ongoing problem. I mean, and the fact that we're dealing with lawyers the one thing that you said in the beginning when we were first dis- discussing the the concept of hallucinations was the lack of any type of follow up for validation. Yeah. You know, to me that is the biggest problem is and it's not just in this case because we've got a, a couple of more use cases that we can actually discuss, but all of these could have been very very easily you know, addressed if somebody had just taken the time to look at what was put back out from the the chat model. But I think it flies in contrast to what the value of these chat models are, because if you think about it, everything about internet culture is all about instant gratification. I want everything now. And I think the reason that these language models took off as well as they did is because it really appeals to that instant gratification. I want to know something and I can, I don't have to dig through websites. I don't have to look at the 10 top links that Google provides me. I can just have that answer right away. And of course, if you're going to be, uh, but to if that, you're point, gonna, if you're going to check your facts, to that point, to that point, we all know that when software is first released, there are bugs, there are issues. I mean, and, and I'm not deliberately trying to, to slam that, that large operating system in Seattle, but we all know you don't load the new version until the first service pack comes out. You know, so why would a language model or something like ChatGPT be any different? It, it, at its core, it's still just a program. And, uh, but unfortunately, I think we know that. I don't think everybody knows that. And I, I think well, a lot of people, they just want that that instant answer and they're not going to look twice. So they're not going to yeah, go check this. You know, I, I think, you know, and what goes directly into this part of the conversation is the the missing piece of how do we identify something that was generated through AI to know? Yeah, I the mean, provenance question is hard of where this stuff came from and kind of the all of the watermarking technology that I've seen is just garbage in terms of being able to easily strip it out, easily uh, fabricate it. And so 
Absolutely. You know, and, and that's going to be the problem as the these LLMs become more and more precise. They're going to, you know, if the hallucinations continue, they're going to continue to probably advance at the same rate of development as the neural networks that they're being hosted on. So it may still be a hallucination, but like you said, if the hallucinations become more and more believable through context, choice of word, this is just going to continue to exacerbate the existing problems. Uh, so, so the next one that we had was uh, Google Bard. And, and I think this was a pretty well documented one, but of course, this was this was Google's big moment to try to compete with OpenAI, and it was kind of their first public showing of Bard. They did a, a demonstration, and I, I guess they didn't thoroughly vet the output from that demonstration because this was a pre-recorded demonstration. It wasn't like it was a live thing either. And uh, during that conversation, or one of those conversations in that presentation that they had with Bard, they asked it a question. Uh, and admittedly, I don't, I don't remember the exact specifics of it, but basically uh, the it, it implied was, the question was, what new discoveries from the James Webb Space Telescope can I tell my nine year old about? And Bard responded with a number of answers, including one su suggesting that the telescope was used to take the very first pictures of a planet outside of Earth's solar system or the exoplanets. And when that was actually fact checked, that was actually done by the European oh, Southern oh, Observatory's very large telescope back in 2004. So yeah. it it was not that it was telling something that didn't happen. It just wasn't right. Because yeah. and of course, of course, this showed real world consequences because as mm -hmm. soon as that happened, we saw the Amper the Alphabet stock just take a nosedive. Yeah, I believe it dropped. I. Where was that? Like five it, to ten percent or something. I want to say it was eight or nine percent overnight. So it real, very real world, and very very quick. Yeah, and then uh, another interesting one that actually I, I, you mentioned to me the the bug bounty stuff. So for anybody that's in cybersecurity, this is an interesting one. Um, Lynn, you want to? Absolutely. Uh, what we're if you're not familiar with bug bounties, this is a an ongoing program by most software developers where people out in the field, people like Hutch, myself, other security researchers, we will go out and actually try and break these products. We will try and break the programs. And then if we can get a bug, we'll turn it into those developers. We get a reward for finding it. They get better software that's more secure. It's a win-win for everybody. The problem is we're starting to see more people who are, have absolutely no bug bounty or bug discovery skills using chat GPT to not only write the bug report, but in sometimes manifest non-existent zero day exploits. So the problem is, is once these developers get these bug reports back from the field, somebody actually has to go through and vet, vet out these reports. If I do A, B, and C, does D happen? Now, in before the, the language model advent, it was very easy for people in the field to look at a report and go, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. They're, this is not real. We can just throw it away. You're not wasting time. Unfortunately, now that we're seeing chat GPT, and as we've already shown in the previous examples, it's able to provide context that's within spec, but may not be actually factually correct. So now we're having security researchers at these development companies spending sometimes multiple days trying to recreate events, only to find out at the end that these were completely fictitious and created by chat GPT or one of the other language models, and they've wasted time, resources, and they're not finding anything to actually help improve the, the solidification of those applications. Yeah, and I would assume one of the challenges here is that if somebody wants to just throw the kitchen sink at one of these bug bounty programs and just submit tens, if not hundreds of submissions, it takes them a matter of minutes to just generate exactly. that via an API through one of these large language models. But then the amount of work required 
to your point, to vet those is going to be so significantly more that you almost see kind of the the human equivalent of the amplification denial of service attacks where you have a very Absolutely. small amount of work done on one side and a tremendous amount of work oh. per unit on the other. And uh, yeah, so yeah. unfortunately, I think that's that's the consequence of what we're seeing is they are being, it's, it's becoming a denial of service. They're not able to do their work anymore or process these bug bounty requests in any meaningful way because of the sheer saturation of just garbage that's being sent to them. Which actually is getting me to question the validity of the long-term effectiveness of bug bounty programs. You know, I don't know if it's one of those things where we stop accepting general submissions from the public. And if you want to become a bug bounty researcher, you have to register with that development company in order to submit. Yeah. But I don't see how maintaining this kind of a model moving forward is sustainable long term. Yeah, and I think this is the one that sticks out to you and me just because of both of our backgrounds in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious what other types of professional activities are crowdsourced in this manner. Because I, I would imagine this is probably not the only thing like this where you're seeing just kind of a, a bombardment of nice sounding AI generated garbage uh, that people are doing for some kind of incentive. I, and again, back to the idea that we're opening up a GPT store to further personalize what you can do with these types of, of applications. I think this is going to be a much bigger problem in the very near future as people try to move away from the standard models and try and personalize. Yeah, agreed. I think so. Uh, I think one question that's worth asking here is we've, we've talked a lot about kind of what hallucinations are within the context of large language models and, and definitely some real world examples. And uh, Lynn, to your point, I imagine most people that have played with them have probably experienced their own interesting anecdotes of these. Uh, but I, I think it's worth digging into why these happen. And um, I guess, Lynn, did you want to take a swing at that? Or if not, I'll... Uh... Uh, you know what? You're, you're, you're the current AI you know, guru. Uh, why don't you, you tee this one up? So I, I, I think that there's various different speculation around this, but I, I think it comes down to multiple factors. One, you've got these systems that are fed, fed kind of the, the whole corpus of the internet. So there is conflicting, uh, I mean, for wh while there is some things that are, are very black and white and very clear what is true and what is not, I, I think a lot of the world involves questions of certainty and opinion. And there are things that are true for one person that are not necessarily true for another. And when you take in the data from all of the internet, you're getting all of those different perspectives fed into this language model. So it's not fed truth, it's fed a, a wide range of different perspectives from the world is round to the world is flat and everywhere in between. And so you have that one factor. Uh, and so of, of course, the way that these systems are working is they're kind of just predicting the next token. And so they are uh, essentially averaging out conclusions based on a probability distribution of, of what should come next. And so uh, again, there, there's no weight assigned to what is true. It's just what is probabilistically next. And I think that's the other big factor is in addition to the fact that you've got this confluence of all of this data from the internet, you also have a system that is uh, executing not as a matter of truth, but as a matter of probability. And so, uh, and also the fact that in, in general, these systems are rarely going to tell you, I don't know, because it's not a matter of knowing or not. It's a matter of what is probabilistically most likely answer to the question that you provided or the the input that you provided. And so if there isn't a well-defined answer for that, that it can use informed on the probability and the data that had previously been provided to it, then it is just going to use that larger probability distribution to create something that sounds like a, a good, well-formed answer, but is uh, essentially anything but. And, and I, I would say that's kind of my best take on why these happen there there has been some interesting uh studies into observability and kind of understanding how the various different neurons within the larger neural network affect the output of these systems and, and those are definitely uh fascinating can i offer a, a different perspective absolutely yeah this is something that i i've been thinking about for a while and i and i think that this this question is is a good way to 
throw this in this out there because I'd love to hear what your take on this is. Can we both agree that language models, Chat GPT, Bard, any of them, they they lack the concept of intent? Can we both I would agree, agree to that? that? Yes, yes, absolutely. So here is my I think you did an, an amazing job at breaking it down from a technical perspective as to why hallucinations happen. But I, I have a different philosophy and I'm, I'm not taking this from science or, or technology. I'm just looking at this at the thousand foot view in the, from this perspective. Like you said, language means different things to different people. I can ask you to hand me a glass of water 37 different ways and the message is the same. The fact that I can put in the same message into the prompt different ways and I will get completely different answers based on the choice of words that I've used. To build off of what you said, there is no intent for the LLM. It's basically just taking raw data from the internet. And like you said, it's just trying to queue up based on the, the neural network and what predictively could be the next question. But I also want to throw out there just for, for conversational purposes, what if it's just misunderstanding the prompt? I mean... How many times have you had to rephrase your question on your prompt to be able to get the actual correct answer? And that also makes me question, are these hallucinations or could it just be some for, some part of a malformed string in your prompt? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely cases where that is going to be. I, because largely where we see these hallucinations anyways is where there isn't uh, well-established documentation, or maybe it is related to events that have taken place since the model was trained. We know that these models have a lag time of a couple of years in most cases in terms of the data that they have. So if you ask them something about something that's happened since that trading data ended, it has no record of it. So I, I, I think there there definitely is kind of a, a level of uh, I, in understanding. I, I so understanding is an interesting term. I, I think that that's, and, and I think there's a whole conversation that could be had to, for that because um, I think I, I, I'm very confident in saying that I don't feel that these systems are conscious or sentient oh, in hell any way. No. But I, I, do think that, I do think that there is a level of understanding because there almost has to be when you, when you make the optimization function guessing the next token. In order to be able to guess the next word in a sentence really effectively, you do have to ha develop an understanding of what is being said. So I, I think there is a factor of understanding there. And I, I think when you break it down in that way, there definitely is an argument for uh, misunderstanding being a potential factor in generating hallucinations or false information. I mean, take a look at, are, are you familiar with Flow GPT? I'm not. Check it out. It's, it's Flo, Flow GPT? F-L-O-W GPT. It's a prompt generator site for basically any LLM out there. And the reason I, I bring this up in regards to the hallucinations is you or I, let, let's just talk about mid journey for just a second, because I, I find that to be a really good example when you're trying to you know get somebody to get a picture in their mind because you're, you're trying to create an image from words. You and I would go in there and say, I want a picture of a hacker wearing a hoodie in a basement. You know, put that same thing into one of these prompt generators and see the fact that it's going to give you four paragraphs worth of description. So that just kind of brings me back to the idea of if we were able to give a true 100% perfect prompt, would these hallucinations still happen? Um, yeah, well, and, and I, well, I think there's two factors to that. I, I agree that that's absolutely a factor. I think there's also the question of, uh, 
if it has some kind of context to base its output on based on its learning set, because I think that's another kind of misunderstanding where uh, maybe there's the ambiguity in language, but there's also the, well, I have no point of reference. And to that, to what you're saying right there, Hutch, do you think that that's a failure on people like OpenAI and Microsoft and Alphabet to where instead of putting in parameters that says, if I don't have any con contextual knowledge up to this question, you know, they don't have a problem saying, I can't give you that the information on how to do something because it goes against our standards. Why don't they have the same type of thing in terms of if I don't have the answer, either say I don't have the answer or just not return anything as opposed to trying to make something up? Well, actually, I think that's an excellent segue into the last section that we had here, which was kind of talking about solutions and ways that uh, some of these problems can be solved. And, and I think that there is one component that I've seen that OpenAI has been using increasingly more, which is their reinforcement learning with human feedback. And, and I know that is one of the things that they're trying to do through that process is uh, minimize these hallucinations by doing that very thing. If it doesn't have a frame of reference or if it doesn't have uh, a correct answer, then being able to actually say, I don't know, or I don't have uh, any knowledge of that subject matter. And so I, I guess to, to take a step back real quick, what RLHF for reinforcement learning with human feedback is, is they essentially get uh, a group of people and OpenAI has made a point to say that they try to get a, a very diverse group of perspectives uh, for people that are engaging in this activity. And they'll use the large language model with a, a single prompt and generate a whole bunch of different outputs. And then they will have those human users rank the outputs based on what is most useful and uh, a helpful response. And through that process, they and it's kind of just a, a traditional reinforcement system where they reward more valuable responses and kind of penalties for less useful responses. And so that's that's one of the processes that we're seeing OpenAI and other language model companies do to try to minimize these hallucination well, as, problems. As one of the AI, you know, thought leaders in the space right now, deal with it. You know, if you don't want the accolades, don't write the book and become a bestseller. <laughs> you know, but I, I I'll, I'll freely admit it. I, I have not delved super deep into how neural networks work. You know, I mean, I understand them, but I haven't done the deep dive. You know, so when we're talking about predictive predictions and how it's trying to generate that next token, I have to believe that there's somewhere in there that they could get some type of statistic on viability based on you know the content data source. You know, case in point, you, something out of our, our wheelhouse. You know, how hard is it to run uh, a responder attack? Okay. Hypothetically speaking, if it can go out and go through all of its data sources and say, I have 3,000 different websites with all of the information in regards to this specific attack, I can look through them, I can correlate them, I have a 98% you know, success rate that I can give a correct answer based on my knowledge. Why can't we do something, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I do feel that, you know, the the human, uh, the the, the uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback is, is probably a good thing to train the model over time, but why are we looking at things so complicated when this, in my opinion, for and again, I'm not a neural network programmer, but I, I've been a programmer in my past. This seems like a very simple solution. So uh, there, there are a couple things that are being done kind of similar to what you described. Uh, it is extremely difficult to really kind of look back at the, the weights of the neural network to understand because there is no indexing of kind of what information it really is just compressing knowledge mm -hmm. so there's there's no easy way based on the neural network for it to identify well i have xyz sources but uh two things that kind of resonate with what you described one is uh increasingly being called retrieval augmented generation or rag architecture 
And you're seeing this actually more with, uh, so GPT-4 has now released a, a version of this. Uh, Bing chat has always, or Bing's large language model has always been based on this. But the idea is rather than the large language model weighing in on truth, it retrieves external sources and then only summarize it uses its knowledge of language to summarize the output from those sources and to cite them directly so rather than making you have to do the sanity check on everything that it says it kind of does that in advance for you and i think that you get more reliable results that way the other thing that is interesting and i've seen a couple of different companies that are doing this they essentially write a wrapper around the uh the API for the language model. And whenever you send a single input, such as a question to the language model, it will actually execute that question in X number of times, 10 times, 100 times, uh, and get all of, get an aggregate number of responses. And the idea is that if you're consistently getting the same response over and over again, you can measure the level of confidence or reliability of that response. Whereas if you're getting a different answer every single time, there's probably very low confidence that uh, that knowledge is effectively compressed into that language model and that it is truthful in the response. So I have seen a, a couple different companies that kind of create that wrapper around it, where in addition to getting a response from the language model, you also get a confidence rating based on that. Now, of course, that comes with a cost because now, with every single time you're interacting with the model, instead of interacting once, you're interacting with it at a, a multiplier That's factor. Right, based on whatever your parameters are set. Exactly. All I can say is, is this sounds like an amazing startup idea. So, yeah, there's, uh, it, it, well, there, there's competition already out there, but it, I mean, yeah, so what they're saying uh, is, is uh, we're going to, we'll, we'll drop the LLC next week. <laughs> hey, why not? Somebody's got to do it, right? Hey, so, why not? But no, I, I think this is, is just fantastic, man. I think we're in for a, a really rude awakening. And unfortunately, I think it's going to cost a lot of people a lot more money before they start realizing that at the end of the day, it's all personal personal accountability. Yep, agreed. I, I think that is the, the biggest solution is at the end of the day, you need to sanity check what you are. If you're applying it to something that is of work value that you're putting your name to and you're using language models to help support you, you need to be doing the additional work to make sure that it is of quality, that it is factual and correct, because at the end of the day, it's your name that's on the line. Absolutely. And well, and unfortunately, possibly your company's name if you're a representative of them. So yeah. even more. Yep, reputation to, uh, takes forever to build and seconds to lose. Yep, truer words have never been spoken. But yeah, man, I, I think we, I think we, we're going to see some crazy stuff coming up. Uh, anything else that you've got as far as you know, throwing out there in terms of, of mitigations, remediations, things to look out for in regards to the hallucinations? Uh, no, I think I, the one other thing that I've seen uh, companies do, well, I guess, uh, two other things. One is uh, you are increasingly seeing, uh, instead of using one large language model, we're seeing various different startups that are using basically this ecosystem of experts, so to speak, where they'll have smaller models that are uh, domain specific. They'll maybe, maybe it'll focus on healthcare, or maybe it'll focus on technology or law or something like that. And you'll have a larger model that kind of just determines what discipline the input is based on and relays it to those expert systems that are more focused on their specific domain. So I, I think that's another thing that we're seeing as far as uh, improving the reliability of these systems. Uh, the one other thing that I'm seeing companies do is basically providing contextual instructions to the language model ahead of time that does say if you don't have citations or some kind of way to back up what you're saying then you need to return a response that says i don't know and so uh, uh, essentially a requirement for citation i think we're going to see some really cool stuff man and i think you know it, to your point i wonder if we're going to start seeing more of a tiered architecture to language models I think so. so. I, I think well, with a something well, actually, small, it's going to reach out to something bigger to reach out to something bigger. And that way you don't have to have the large footprint to run an extra, you know, a huge model. 
and then maybe we'll start seeing more of a tiered architecture and services based on those tiers. Yeah, I think we may already be seeing that and just not general public awareness of that because there was actually some conversation coming out of OpenAI that, and of course they never formally released the entire architecture for GPT-4, but there has been a lot of discussion suggesting that GPT-4 is not a single model, but instead that it is kind of that multi-tiered architecture mm. of multiple models. Uh, weighing in and performing various different components of the Well, I mean, that would output. make sense if, if we take a look at just the concept of, uh, you know, microservices and, you know, a SaaS style architecture. I mean, this makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Well, and it's also going to be more compute efficient because if you exactly. can use a smaller model that's domain specific rather than constantly bombarding just this massive monstrosity of a general model, it's going to cost them less than the end of the day to be able to return mm -hmm. potentially just as high of quality of output. So, so I think you're right. I think that that's where the future lies. We're going to see rather than continuing to uh, grow these bigger and bigger monstrous models, we'll still have these monstrous architectures. I think they'll still be there, but they're going to be a resource things. that you're going to reach out and connect into for whatever pieces of that giant model you need for your smaller model. Yeah, agreed. Amazing talk ja, there, buddy. Amazing talk. Huh? Yep. Yeah. This hallucinations is always an interesting topic. And uh, who, who would have thought, I, and I don't think this was on anybody's radar prior to large language models hitting the scene that we would have this future where AI well, would just be just making up. Let's be honest. Prior to LLMs, hallucinations were bugs. Yeah. The only difference is the fact that we're dealing in output from a computer that's using, utilizing words and language, but it's nothing more than a bug. When it's much harder to control, I guess. It's... And probably much harder to debug with the total amount of parameters that you have to look at in order to get an answer out of the, out of the system to begin with. Yeah, I, I agree. That's that's one of the biggest challenges. That there is no single line that you can trace it back to and change it. It's it's all just compressed within the uh, essentially numerical values and billions of weights that are in these neural nets. And yeah, there's there's no easy way to troubleshoot those bugs, so to speak. So uh, yet, yet, yep. It, and and that's that's something that I do want to touch on at some point is observability because there is some really interesting research going on about trying to better understand what is going on in these neural networks. And a lot of it is very analogous to kind of understanding what's going on in the human brain of kind of figuring out what neurons are firing based on. Oh, we can have an amazing conversation because one of the topics that I was going to bring up is, did you know that they're actually using uh, neurons from the human brain in some of the new quantum uh, hybrid semiconductors? No, that, this is this is news to me. It sounds uh... so we've we've been talking about AI for a while. So I you brought me on to give you some of the futurist stuff. So yeah, they're actually experimenting with actual human neurons as part of an actual semiconductor or processor for quantum-based computers, because if you think about it, the brain is basically just putting electricity across a neural network. So I think that a lot of the advancements in the research that we're seeing in LLMs are actually going to correspond over into biological as we move forward. Yeah, that'll factor in significantly to brain computer interfaces too. And the future is so weird, man. I've, I've even seen recently somebody post or somebody had uh, basically built a computer out of mushrooms, out of fungus. Yep, and and was able to uh, do computation from that. So yeah, it's a uh, well, and then all I interesting just things. Another do. really great article the other day, and yeah, these are teasers, you know, that might turn into episodes for people. But uh, I believe it was MIT found a way to turn the, the tensile surface of your skin into a three D antenna. So it turns wow. your entire body into an antenna. That sounds and, up your alley. <laughs> and we've actually grown some actual human skin around a metallic robotic hand that if you cut it, it will bleed and it will heal. Wow. All right. Well, plenty to talk about in the future. Um, but again, this, this has been a fascinating conversation. I'm looking forward to more to come. Um, Absolutely. Thanks for another great episode, Hutch. All right. That's all. Over and out.
hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cybercognition Podcast with Hutch, part of the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then add this show to your favorite podcast player. Subscribe to the ITSP Magazine YouTube channel and share the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand to our conversations and our audience, visit ITSPMagazine.com to learn how to sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24.